And we're very sorry to have to say that one of our speakers today, Roz Barber in London, is not able to be with us. However, she does have plans to give her talk on Marlowe uh, early next year in our uh, schedule in February. So we'll all look forward to that. Now here is our hostess, Sylvia Holmes. And I wanted to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Peter Dawkins. Peter Hi, is Sylvia. a specialist in sacred architecture and a pioneer in the rediscovery of landscape temples and the Western geomantic tradition. He has written several books, including Francis Bacon, The Herald of the New Age. We're very excited to hear him talk about Francis Bacon with regard to the Shakespeare authorship question. Please welcome Peter Dawkins. Huh. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for the introduction and hello, everybody. Um, this is a very interesting uh, conference, I think. Uh, many hands make light work. This is the big question, really, and, um, and it's very, I think it's very, very true one. Um, so I'm going to approach the Bacon side of it from a slightly different angle to what you've probably all been used to, because I don't want to show all the same stuff over and over again anymore. And uh, so I'm going to take it, in, take it in a new way. So I hope you'll enjoy, enjoy this. It's actually very well recorded that Francis Bacon both knew and worked with numerous poets and writers throughout most of his life some of whom formed his literary studio of good pens, as he called them. And the forming of such a group may have begun soon after he returned from France in March 1579, or from 1587 when he became a reader at Gray's Inn and had the Bacon Chambers extended. It certainly established itself in all earnest when Anthony Bacon, his brother, returned to England in 1592 and set up in literary partnership uh, with his brother Francis, quickly resulting in the launch of Shakespeare onto the public arena. I hope you've take that in. <laughs> now, Ben Johnson became one of these good men, good, good pens. He revered Bacon and paid tribute to him with the same words as he used in his tribute to the author William Shakespeare in the 1623 Shakespeare Folio. So Johnson, in his quotes, says that Bacon is he who hath filled up all numbers and performed that in our tongue, which may be compared or preferred either to insolent Greece or haughty Rome. Now, these are the same words that Johnson says in the Shakespeare folio in a tribute to William Shakespeare, the author. In other words, he, his quote is, leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth or since did from their ashes come. Now in 1626, just after Francis Bacon had died, a collection of elegiac tributes known as the Manes Verilamiani was published in memory of Sir Francis Bacon who is titled Baron Verulam of Verulam and Viscount St. Auburn. In these tributes, Bacon is likened to Apollo, the brilliant light bearer, the day star and leader of the choir of muses. For instance, a quote from John Williams, how is it happened to us, the disciples of the muses, that Apollo, the leader of our choir, should die, and, and so on. You can read them on what I'm showing you. Then those who are giving these tributes further liken Francis Bacon to Pallas Athena, the tenth muse. Ah, the tenth muse and glory of the choir has perished. Ah, never before has Apollo himself been truly unhappy. They also make clear that he was a concealed poet, 
and wrote such comedies and tragedies that they renovated philosophy. For instance, the quote says, let expediency consider the better part of counsel, but add a concealed poet from Ithaca and you hold awe. Another quote says, as Eurydice wandering through the shades of Dis longed to caress Orpheus, so did philosophy, entangled in the subtleties of schoolmen, seek Bacon as a deliverer. He renewed her, walking humbly in the socks of comedy. After that, more elaborately, he rises on the loftier buskin of tragedy. Now Orpheus was renowned as a poet, and such comedies and tragedies are stage plays. Since they rescued and renewed philosophy, they were clearly famous and influential, but Bacon's name as their author was concealed. Now both Apollo and Athena were known as the divine spear shakers or Shakespeare's. And herein lies an answer to the authorship of the Shakespeare works. And this is subtly confirmed by Thomas Vincent in his tribute to Bacon, where he says, but your fame adheres not to sculptured columns, nor is read on the tomb, stay traveller your steps. Now the only tomb with such wording to match stay traveller your steps is to be found on the Shakespeare monument, erected in Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon. This monument was erected sometime after the death in April 1616 of Will Shakespeare of Stratford, and before the printing of the 1623 Shakespeare folio, which refers to the monument. Inscription on the Shakespeare monument not only refers to the monument being a tomb, but also contains the unusual if not unique wording, stay passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Moreover, the first line in Latin translates as a pilus in judgment, a Socrates in genius, a marrow in art. Now this description of the author Shakespeare as being like Nestor, king of Pilus, who was a renowned statesman, judge, and advisor of kings and princes. And like Socrates, the celebrated Greek philosopher and orator, who was famous for his use of the inductive process. And like Virgil, whose surname was Maro, the prince of Roman poets, who was a scholar and high initiate of the mysteries. Now this description applies to one person, and one person only, and that is Francis Bacon. Now Francis Bacon called his great project, of which the Shakespeare plays are part, he called it the Great Instauration. And this referenced the instauration or building a new Solomon's Temple, which is famous for its twin pillars of brass, known as the Great Pillars, that stand at the entrance. But in Bacon's case, this temple was to be a temple of light in the human mind through the reformation and renewal of all arts and sciences. The Bacon symbolized the temple as a pyramid, called it the pyramid of philosophy. And this whole project required history, philosophy, and poetry. History forms its foundation, which is a collection of facts from observations and experience. The philosophy is the temple of light, which is the knowledge of truth, the wisdom or laws of the universe, physical, metaphysical, and summary, the summary or supreme law being that of love. And poetry is the means to build the temple. It's the means to build this temple of philosophy. And as Bacon um, explains, poetry is associated with the art of imagination. And so for this, he imagined or, 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 or put in motion 
experiments, theatre and ritual, all using the imagination and done in a poetic way. Now, the advancement of learning was first begun as a project by Nicholas Bacon from a mission given to him by King Henry VIII. First intended for the training of lawyers, Nicholas Bacon developed the project into one for the advancement of learning and training of lawyers, statesmen and wards of court in service of the king or queen and country. This included a Renaissance education and training in all the arts and sciences, including oratory, poetry, theater, languages, ancient and modern, diplomacy and intelligence gathering. This he was able to do in Queen Elizabeth I's reign when he was knighted as Sir Nicholas Bacon and made Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. And this became the raison d'etre of the group to which Sir Nicholas Bacon belonged, which would become named as the Society of the Golden and Rosy Cross in 1570-1571. Now, St. George, the Red Cross Knight, whose emblems were a rose and a spear, personified the members of the society and their purpose, which was to shake their lances of light at the dragons, which means the eyes, as it's called, or souls, of ignorance and vice, so as to illuminate them and raise them to knowledge and virtue. And this is the purpose that was stated by Ben Jonson in his tributary poem to the author prefacing the Shakespeare folio in each of which he seems to shake a lance as brandished at the eyes of ignorance. And hence the birth and death days of Shakespeare is said to be on St. George's day. Now the promotion of the advancement of learning, of course, by Sir Nicholas Bacon, but also by um, his friend, William Cecil, who became Lord Burley, and their households. And they were each married to uh, very, very well-educated women who were sisters to each other. Nicholas Bacon was married to Anne Cook and William Cecil to Mildred Cook. They were the highest learned ladies at that time. And in London, their, their places uh, were York, where they lived and um, did their education, was York House in London for Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon and Cecil later called Burley House, just across the road in the Strand in London. That was William Cecil and Mildred Cook's um, house. And in the country, Gorhambury was the Bacon's house and Theobald's was the Cecil's house, where this great education and training took place. Now, part, part of what Henry VIII had asked for was a special college or inn of court to be set up for the training of such people. And so Queen Elizabeth suggested it should be Gray's Inn, which both Nicholas Bacon and William Cecil were elders of. And this became the headquarters for the advancement of learning, Gray's Inn in London. Now the Rosicrucian fraternity or society was founded in 1570, 71. And in 1572, there was a great supernova in Cassiopeia constellation Cassiopeia, known as the Heavenly Queen. And at the same time, Francis Bacon, who was at university then, had his great vision of what he should do. And he, he saw, he, taking up his father's work, the advancement of learning, he expanded it and, and saw it as being a worldwide advancement of learning in which poetry, especially theatre, plays a key role. And that same year, the Accession Day tournaments began in England to celebrate the Queen's Accession Day. And King Arthur and the Fairy Queen or Virgin Queen, plus the Knights and Ladies of the Round Table uh, took centre place in all these tournaments and so on. So it's theatre on a grand scale. And this is one of the many portraits done of Queen Elizabeth I, known as the Rainbow Portrait. That she quite she was quite happy to present herself as the Virgin Queen or Fairy Queen. That is the Queen of King Arthur's, and she was the Queen of the Round Table. Now, from the time of Francis Bacon's return from France to England in 1579, 
several groups of poets started to form in London, such as the Areopagus of Poets, the University Wits, as they're called, and the Earl of Oxford's group. The Areopagus was a literary clique which, under the leadership of Gabriel Harvey, supported the introduction of classical metres into English verse. Areopagitae included Sir Philip Sidney, Gabriel Harvey, Fulk Greville, Edward Dyer, Thomas Drant, Master Preston, Master Still, and Emerito, which is a pseudonym. Gabriel Harvey had been Francis and Anthony Bacon's tutor in rhetoric and poetry at Cambridge University, so they knew each other well. And there are indications that Francis Bacon was Emerito, whose poetic works were later published under the name of Edmund Spencer. These poetic works, especially The Fairy Queen, is a pointer to what was going on under the banner of the Rose Cross or the Red Cross Knight. So you can see this subtle signature here in this title page. The modern phrase university wits refers to a group of poet playwrights and pamphleteers who were educated at the two English universities, Oxford or Cambridge. They included Christopher Marlowe, Robert Green, and Thomas Nash from Cambridge, and John Lyley, Thomas Lodge, and George Peel from Oxford. However, the Inns of Court were also considered to be a university, of which Gray's Inn was preeminent in containing the chief poet playwrights of the time. One of these university wits was Francis Bacon from Cambridge University and Gray's Inn, although he remained mostly hidden as such from the wider public and from posterity. And this was partly from choice and partly from necessity. His brother, Anthony Bacon, was also a poet and a partner with, with Francis in the grand project of the Great Inspiration. Anthony went abroad in 1579 for 12 years as an intelligencer on behalf of his uncle, Lord Burley and the Queen. When he returned home in 1592, the Shakespeare works began. Now the Areopagus and the University Wits use Leicester House on the Strand as a meeting place. There's Leicester House on this old map of London. And this is the Strand I'm pointing to running down here to Charing Cross. And here you get the palace of the Queen. Now this house was built on the site of the Outer Temple, originally part of the Temple, the English headquarters of the Knights Templar. So that's the Outer Temple, the site of Leicester House, later called Essex House. That's the Middle Temple, and then you get the Inner Temple. So Leicester House was the London home then, of, uh, to start with, of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. And he was a notable patron of poets and a promoter of the theatre. And he encouraged his London house to be used for literary and poetic gatherings. And as a Dudley, Robert was the uncle of Philip Sidney and his sister Mary. In 1578, he also became the stepfather of Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, and Robert's sisters, Penelope and Dorothy, when he, Robert, married Lettice Knollys, the widow of Walter Devereux, first Earl of Essex. Francis Bacon knew Philip and Mary Sidney, as also Robert, Penelope and Dorothy Devereux, from childhood. And over the years, they became good friends. Mary Sidney became the Countess of Pembroke in 1577, when she married Henry Herbert, second Earl of Pembroke. And her sons were William and Philip Herbert, the incomparable pair of brethren to whom the 1623 first folio of Shakespeare's plays was dedicated. Francis Bacon was also friends with Fulk Greville, the renowned lifelong friend of Philip Sidney, and also with Henry Riothsley, the third Earl of Southampton, who had been raised by the Cecil family at Burley House as a ward of Bacon's uncle, Lord Burley, and who later went to Cambridge University and Gray's Inn. This group of friends later formed the initial Shakespeare Circle, meeting at Essex House in London, or Wilton House, the Pembroke's country home. They were assisted by the poets, writers, dramatists, musicians, and scribes that they patronized or employed. However, when Essex's rebellion and execution took place in 1601, and Anthony Bacon died soon after, 
and then there's a change of the throne and sovereignty. Queen Elizabeth died and King James came to the throne. Then the Shakespeare work was carried on by Francis Bacon with the help of his good pens and the remaining group of patrons. Now the birth of Shakespeare itself, that's, that's to say the Shakespeare works. In 1592, Anthony Bacon returned to England. And it's noteworthy that it was shortly after Anthony Bacon arrived in England and joined his brother that the Shakespeare plays and poems started to appear. And later on in 1592, two novi in Cassiopeia appeared, twin stars. And this was a signal to Anthony and Francis Bacon to begin their work. And Anthony and Francis Bacon are the two poets that are referred to in Shakespeare's sonnets. And they work together as the Gemini brothers, which is a key feature of the Shakespeare works. The Gemini, the Gemini brothers at any rate, are known as the Spear Shakers. And here's a nice uh, emblem from an emblem book in 1571 that shows them on their white horses, carrying their long spears. They're known as Shakespeare's. But the two Gemini brothers, Gemini means twins, the two, two brothers, one being mortal, the other immortal, they also have sisters. So here's a nice painting of, of, of two of them being born from one egg and the other two of them being born from the second egg. These are the immortals and these lower down are the mortals. And so this, this is a theme that lies behind virtually, well, all, all the Shakespeare works, in fact. So there are Gemini headpieces that are put as a signature on each of the types of Shakespeare, of Shakespeare works, the poems, sonnets, and plays. So first on the poems, I show this Gemini headpiece. And here the Gemini are shown winged and rather pan-like figures. They are spirits. They represent the spiritual world. And each of them comes out of a letter A. The double A is a signature of the Rosicrucians. And this face in between is face of bride with her veil down. And that represents truth revealed, the full truth revealed. So this headpiece represents the spiritual world with the Gemini there as spirits. And then for the sonnets, the headpiece shows the Gemini brothers as winged human beings, as it were, winged souls. So they're flying in the heaven, but it's, they're not the spirits, they're, they're human souls. So this shows the, the soul realm or celestial realm, as it's, as it's called. And there's the figure of bridal, truth revealed in the center with her crown on, but it's much smaller than the spiritual one. And then for the plays, the Shakespeare plays, the folio of Shakespeare plays is signed with this Gemini headpiece, where the two Gemini are, are two boys naked and haven't got wings, and they're reclining on the two letter A's, the AA, the signature of the Rosicrucians. So just to make it very clear that the Gemini theme underlies all the Shakespeare work, and the way it's portrayed gives a clue as to what each, each of the works for. And 1593, and, and followed by 1594, the Shakespeare poems were published with the Shakespeare name as author on the dedication page. These are also the headpieces again, Gemini headpieces, but it actually shows you um, the rabus of two conies. Rabbits or hares in those days were known as conies, and rabus is, is a symbolic way of, of giving somebody's name. And so these are two conies back to back, baconi. And here we see that this is in Shakespeare's sonnets. Then Bacon's Novum Organum, again published, or also published with the headpiece of the Gemini, shown here as spirits. And they have the two conies back to back, which I'm pointing to now, baconi. And then the Shakespeare folio, very similar, the two conies back to back. And then down in the Marnes Verulami Arni, which is the tributes given to Bacon when he died, here you've got the two Gemini winged boys with their spears. 
spear shakers shaking their spears at the dragons or eyes of ignorance. You haven't got two conies here, but instead you've got two squirrels with their acorns back to back. And therein lies another mystery, which I'll talk about another time. Well, in 1593 was published Venus and Adonis, and in 1594, The Rape of Lucrece. These are actually poems that act as twins to each other. So you've got the Gemini again. And also the two years, 1593-1594, act as twins to each other. During this time, the first recorded performances of any of the Shakespeare plays that we know of, which are the trilogy of Henry, this Henry the Sixth, parts one, two, and three, Titus Andronicus, The Taming of the Shrew, and possibly Richard III under the title of Buckingham. These were performed by Lord Strange's men and Pembroke's men during 1592 to four. But it wasn't until 1598 that any of the plays, which are called Shakespeare plays, were associated with the name of William Shakespeare. In 1594, going into 1595, there was the Gray's Inn Christmas Revels at which the Comedy of Errors was played. These revels were called the Prince of Purple and the Honourable Order of the Knights of the Helmet. Now in October 1594, Francis Bacon was appointed as a co-treasurer of Gray's Inn for the new legal year in order to assist in recovering, this is a quote, in recovering the lost honour of Gray's Inn in respect of the annual Christmas revels. The treasurer is responsible for the revels. Bacon was well known as being able to do this. The revels were grand entertainments performed over the 12 days of Christmas, consisting of masks with music and dancing, plays, speeches, etc., all in imitation of the Queen's Court as well as the courts of law. And Francis Bacon had by then become renowned for his devising presenting of masks and entertainments at Gray's Inn and the Royal Court at Greenwich, and in writing speeches and devices to be used in the Queen's Succession Day tilts. Now, on the first grand night of these 12 days of Christmas, the Comedy of Errors was performed. And this whole Comedy of Errors is all about a descent into chaos. The play was written and performed by members of Gray's Inn as per usual. And the play is about two sets of twins, immortal gentlemen, so-called immortal gentlemen, known as Antiphilos, and mortal servants, referred to as Dromeo. So these acted as the immortal and mortal Gemini. And it takes place in two places, or two places are referred to in the play. Ephesus, which is famous for its temple of Artemis, and Syracuse, which is famous for its temple of Apollo. And Apollo and Artemis are twins, brother and sister. The Honourable Order of the Knights of the Helmet is all about the restoration of order out of the chaos. And this was written, and is well known to be written by Francis Bacon. And the Knights of the Helmet are all given helmets. And the helmet refers to the golden helmet of Pallas Athena, which she gives to her knight heroes. And golden helmet in German language is Will Helm, Will Helm or William. William comes from Will Helm, which means golden helmet. And this refers to the helmet of Pallas Athena, the sphere shaker, which she gives to her knight heroes. The knights themselves are spear shakers, hence William Shakespeare, hence the Shakespeare fraternity of knights and their ladies, the St. George or Rose Cross fraternity. Now, the Shakespeare play Love's Labour's Lost was intended for the rebels, but was unable to be performed as the second grand night was cancelled. The play satirises all male societies and an intellectualism that shuts itself away from life, showing that truth is actually love, such as can be seen in a woman's eye or to be experienced in their company or to be practised as charity. And this is the major theme of all Francis Bacon's philosophy and teachings. And the play is full of references to people and incidents known to the Bacon brothers and includes some personal details about Henry de Noir that only someone who knew him well could have known. Now, Anthony 
was good friends with Henry of Navarre and stayed with him and his sister Catherine during the summer of 1584. Francis Bacon also knew him well, and so on. I can go on, on and on about this. And all the plays you'll find have references known to the Bacon brothers and so on, and huge detail. Anthony Bacon actually ran an intelligence network inherited from Francis Walsingham. Uh, he ran it together with his brother. And I think I've, my time has run out, so I'd better stop there. Thank you very much. I have a question. How did you get started in the Shakespeare authorship question? <laughs> I, was, I was thrown into it, really. And um, um, just after I got married, I, I met a remarkable woman called Hope Bramold, who was the secretary of the Francis Bacon Society in England, which is one of the oldest literary society that we have in England, in fact. And, um, and she started, she recognized something in me, I think, and started talking about some of the secret life of Francis Bacon. And um, it just rang bells for me. And, and um, anyway, I was an architect then. So I went back, I was living in Edinburgh, went back to Edinburgh and carried on with my work. But I was woken up a few weeks later with a dream and um, <laughs> it made, very clear. I caught call being who appeared. I called him the master, and he said, "Now we begin our work together." And that that work entailed going into the whole Bacon story, which is the Shakespeare story, and far more than that, because it's like a window into the whole wisdom stream. And um, yeah, so that that that's what it's the wisdom stream that really fascinates me most, <laughs> but. But, but also, it's very interesting to know all, all the people who are involved in it too. They're wonder, you know, wonderful people, all having to get on with their ordinary life in their various whatever roles they were doing. You know, we're all actors on the stage of the world, as Shakespeare says. And so everyone has to perform their parts best they can. And we all make mistakes as we go along and so on. But, you know, there were those in this Rosicrucian fraternity who were really trying to do their best, and some of them belonged to the Shakespeare fraternity. It was great, and it was many hands make light, well, they don't make light work. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> difficult work, challenging, but, but so worthwhile doing, you know, this whole poetical, theatrical work. Um, and it's key, key to life. And, you know, we, we're performing it all the time. Our everyday life is theatre. So we're all performing it all the time in order to reach an enlightenment, a knowledge of truth, and, um, and so on. <laughs> it gives me great purpose. To, I, I, would, I would have loved to have been part of it. Here's another question from Frank Lawler. I get the impression that Anthony and Francis were exceedingly busy with everything that they were doing. Would they have had time to create or even supervise the Shakespeare canon? Oh, yeah. Um, they, they had they, they had time. I mean, they did lots of other things too. I mean, it's a full, full on work, really. But they were both poets. They they loved loved doing it, and it was their main mode for the advancement of learning, as it was called, and which Bacon then later called the Great Inspiration. And um, so, theatre was all important. So so. Yeah, they, and they helped, they had their good pens. You know, they helped out, they were friendly with other poets and so on. And, and uh, particularly with Mary Sidney, you know, she was a deep friend and, and Philip Sidney until he died. You know, he died young. He was a great poet. And they were good friends, the Bacon brothers and the, <laughs> and the Sidneys. And, uh, and Francis Bacon, uh, Sir Anthony Bacon died in 1601, but. Francis Bacon carried on his friendship with Mary Sidney and her sons um, right, right on, on and on, right, right until Bacon died, Francis Bacon died. So that they were close and of course she was a poet too, you know, <laughs> she contributed to the whole thing. <laughs> As so also you, so you think Mary, Mary Sidney is one of the authors? Yes, I think Francis Bacon is the chief author. He is acknowledged as such and it comes out as such. 
but you can see a woman's touch in the plays and you know either she wrote a few things herself or she was advising all the time and so on and certainly she was a, a big support to begin with Anthony Bacon provided much of the money for it all but um she also when she I mean she she wasn't in control of the finances you know her husband was but but when she had a bit more control over things she could help finance things as well herself here's another question this one's from Mark Mendiza. Do you have thoughts about what happened to the Shakespeare Brotherhood and its traditions when all the theaters were closed? Well, the plays initially were put on for the court, for the, for the queen. She passed an act quite early in her reign um, to, to allow um, theater companies to exist, but only if they were patronized by the nobility. And then they all the plays were to be done for her, <laughs> primarily for her. So all, all these sort of plays had to be presented at court first in front of her. And of course, they were all, all had to pass the sentence and so on to do so. Um, but for the Shakespeare circle who were behind these Shakespeare plays, they, they were high up in positions so they could pull a few, few strings. You know, they weren't, so the Shakespeare plays were not so heavily edited as other plays were by other playwrights. And, um, but they're all presented at court first. So even when the theatres weren't operating, it still went on in, in front, of, front of the Queen at court or in noblemen's houses and so on. Here's a question from Peter Bull. The Rosicrucian theme is often seen as being central to the Shakespeare phenomenon. Is there any documented history of this movement prior to the Rosicrucian pamphlets starting in 1616? Well, the English group was the first to call itself by that name. That, that's the one thing to know. But they were parts that they were first founded in, in Henry VIII's time, and Sir Thomas More was involved with this as well. And Henry and uh, Sir Nicholas Bacon, Nicholas Bacon then was um, an early member of it. But it was formed by um, Agrippa who came over from Paris where he had been leading a, a similar group over in Paris and they were looking at the that they were carriers of the ancient wisdom and trying to develop their knowledge of this further and further and it, it goes right back to goes right through the whole renaissance the undercurrent of the renaissance uh, going on um, which started in Florence of course and um, and then because that was bringing together all of all different traditions from different cultures and finding the fundamental wisdom behind it all. So this whole stream of wisdom knowledge was passing through Europe, um, you know, interesting various people who shared their knowledge as best they could, either going to meet each other or by communicating by letter and so on with each other. And occasionally they could form groups in certain places and one of them was was in Paris and um, when Agrippa came over from there and set set another group up going in England who, of people who are also interested in these things and um, and that developed on into Queen Elizabeth's time and um, and then they decided in 1570-71 to adopt the ancient symbol of the rose and the cross, the rosy cross. The, ro the, the cross is the cross of light. It's symbolized by gold, which is the color of the sun. Um, and heraldically, when you use gold as a, heraldically as a color, it's uh, red. The red color represents gold, gold metal. So the golden cross is the same as the red cross, the cross of light. And the rose symbolizes the human soul that is trying to that symbolically is attached to the cross or nailed to the cross because it's trying to carry out all that the cross of light means. And the cross of light represents the laws of God, the base fundamental laws, the word of God. So when you, and your soul will blossom as a result when it does that. So the rose symbolizes that, the rose and the cross. Um, and for various reasons, the, this group wanted to use that name at that time. 
Um, and it co coincides actually with the excommunication by the Pope of Queen Elizabeth I. I mean, already the Church of England was separate and so on, thanks to Henry VIII. But the Pope wanted to declare this in order to encourage um, Roman, Roman Catholic countries like Spain and France to actually invade England, kill the Queen and take over and re-establish Roman Catholicism there. So this group wanted to, you know, be, be protectors of, of the Queen and the country and so on in that way. And um, yeah, and, and also they wanted to raise, underlying it, they wanted to raise people's consciousness in a big, big educational uh, method, which Nicholas Bacon had developed as the advancement of learning. In Germany at Kassel, um, published under the auspices of the Duke, Duke there, who was a great friend of Francis Bacon and so on. And, and that, that was, so just, just as the initial group in England was set up in Henry VIII's time by, um, by a group who came over from France. So the English group as developed by Francis Bacon later on with the Shakespeare plays and so on, it was able to export its greater knowledge back to Europe again and set up um, little groups abroad to do that. And, and so, it, and then it flourished, it really took off. And then the name was used by many, many, many other groups right up to today. Wow, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to move on because this is a three, <laughs> three, uh, three different candidate kind of event today. And Marlow is dead, it, uh, was buried in the unmarked grave uh, in the Deptford Church. End of story. But not, of course, the end of story, since there's been, as you already suggested, Violet, an enormous amount of ink spilled about what the hell actually happened in Eleanor Bull's house in Deptford on May 30th. And, and what, what would be your best guess of what happened? My best guess is it was an assassination. It turns out that that uh, I mean, it turns out that by a set of peculiar accidents of the sort that happen all the time, the name of the the person who killed Marla was misentered in a register, and so the document from which I've just quoted was not actually discovered until uh, the 1920s. Uh, because people were looking for the wrong name and uh, in uh, the records. And it was only then in the 1920s that a actually a, uh, an American uh, recently Harvard PhD student working in the archives realized the, the error that had been made and was able to track down in a fantastic piece of literary detective work the all right. right, our next speaker is Rosemary O'Laughlin, and I met Rosemary at the Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable book club that started a year ago. We've read four books already, and we're on our fifth, which is a book by Roger Stripmatter called the Shakespeare Authorship Source Book. Um, Rosemary is an Oxfordian, and she has been so for about 10 years. She is a lawyer and an actor living and working in Dublin. In August, she premiered her one-woman show, A Rose by Any Other Name, at Edinburgh Fringe Festival to a very positive press and audience reviews. Rosemary will be performing for us the first scene of A Rose by Any Other Name, which I'm very grateful for because I didn't get to go to Scotland. She has asked me to mention that the scene contains a number of excerpts from Shakespeare's plays and in the interest of timing and being seated, she has decided to shorten two of them. So please welcome Rosemary O'Laughlin. Her name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called. My dad was born in 1928 on a farm in Cordell near Castle Island, County Kerry. 
the land. Thank you, Rosemary. Excellent. Ah, oh, I, I wish I could see the rest of it. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have questions for Rosemary, please put them in the chat. I have one here. If there were to be a new smoking gun discovered next week that proved your theory, what do you hope it turns out to be? Um, I, I suppose um, from an Oxfordian perspective, um, that there, there is a reference to um, a, a piece of writing by the Earl of Oxford about the a mean gentleman um, at court. And um, this particular piece of writing was referred to um, by Francis Peck, and he was going to publish this piece that he came across, uh, which were, I understand, in Abraham Fleming's manuscripts. And then there was no sign of this manuscript ever being published by Peck. So was it published well we know the manuscript wasn't published but where did he find this piece of text by the Earl of Oxford about the mean gentleman because if that you know was a reference to the play Twelfth Night and if mean gentleman was Malvolio um I think that would be a massive piece of I am utterly convinced it's the Earl of Oxford and um I would put my my apartment on it you know, in the morning, if you, you know, if, if someone said to me that, you know, what were you prepared to give up to if, if we knew the answer, you know, what would you prefer to give up to show it? Well, I, I'd like to hear about this, the Fringe Festival. I've never been. I was never at the Fringe Festival either, Sylvia, until I went for the first time in August and obviously went there as a performer. And it was, I suppose, a baptism of fire. It was a very steep learning curve. Um, and there are certain things that looking back, I probably would do a little bit differently, but um, there were some wonderful magic moments. And one of these, you know, for example, was um, I was staying in student accommodation, Pollock Hall, um, and to go to perform every night, I would walk down in a particular direction. And I walked down a street called Oxford Street. And at the corner of that street, there was a house and there was a rose bush there. And for me, that was very meaningful. When I'm in a situation where it's it's challenging in many respects, I always look for the symbols and I always look for the signs from the universe. And indeed, my in my play, you know, when, when you'll see the whole lot of it, um, you'll see that these kind of signs pop up a lot. Other than that, what's it like? Well, I can tell you that there was... Um, an awful lot of competition this year in the fringe and I think post COVID um, there was and I think it was four and a half thousand productions were competing with each other for an audience it, it's difficult to kind of pick and choose all these artists they all have something unique to say and there's a great atmosphere there and a great conviviality and a great support it's wonderful to have put the play on there because I have the confidence now that it does work and an audience will respond. And in the rest of the play, then I go into all the places that I travelled to and I talk a lot more about, you know, the associations with the Earl of Oxford and my findings. Here's a question from Renee Euchner. Rosemary, my United States friends really enjoyed meeting you and watching your show. Wow. They're Shakespeare agnostics, and you were very convincing. Could you share a bit on how the fringe went? Did you actually meet her friends, I wonder? I don't know. But Catherine Sharp says, Rosemary, what evidence convinces you that Sir Thomas Smith was Edward de Vere's tutor in Edward de Vere's early years? Is this contested by other Oxfordians? I noticed Richard Mal Malam did not include it in his timeline in his new book, Shakespeare Revolution. Isn't it rather important information about Edward de Vere's education, if true? Um, yeah, now I'll be perfectly honest. I haven't looked behind. I have read that uh, Sir Thomas Smith was the tutor of uh, Edward de Vere. And there is two possible places, Hill Hall and Anchorwick or some, that there are the two possible places. But um, as to the exact source evidence for that, I haven't investigated that. So I'm relying on other Oxfordian materials. So unfortunately, I'm not scholarly enough to answer that question. Well, here's one you can answer. Michael Delahoyd says, can you tell us anything specific about Northern Italy? Because I'm assuming you went, right? 
Oh yeah, Michael, the um, the big thing, <laughs> there were two big scenes for me that I have in the second half of the play. Um, so one big discovery, and I think it's uh, it's already possibly known within Oxfordian circles, um, there is a fresco of Portia, Cato's daughter, the wife of Brutus. There is a fresco of her in the La Foscari on the walls. Now, as we know, um, Richard Rowe and Naomi Maigrey both conducted independent research and both of them pinpointed Villa Foscari as the real life home of Portia from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. And they went through the references in that play that indicated where, Villa, where Belmont was and their five coordinates. And independently, they both look, uh, pinpointed Villa Foscari. So, Obviously, I went there, you know, out of interest. It's not open very often, so I was delighted to be able to finally go at a time it was open. For me, it was a real eye-opener that there is a fresco of Portia on those walls. Um, and again, I think this is something that Oxfordians, you know, another slew in our armour for why Edward de Vere is, um, is Shakespeare. Because... <clears throat> The, there's only two Portia's in Shakespeare. There's the real Portia who's in Julius Caesar. And then there's this fictitious Portia from The Merchant of Venice. Now, she just happens to be called Portia and her house is in Italy. And there's a real, the real Portia is there as well. So that's, what, that's why Edward de Vere is such a genius. He's always linking things in. There's layers and layers and you have to kind of unravel them. Um, and I think that's, it's the complexity of that that makes our case difficult to convince people because you have to put in the work with Edward Tiver, you have to put in the work um, and then when you do, you'd be rewarded in seeing that he is Shakespeare but it's not a give me 10 bullet points please as to why Edward Tiver is Shakespeare but he works in such a multi-layered way um, and that's that's the thrill, for me that's the thrill of uh, Edward Tiver. I went out to Mantua to um, the Church of Santa Maria della Grazia where the tomb of um, Baldessari Castiglione is located and there's a statue done by Giulio Romano on top of it. That statue is, I think, referenced in The Winter's Tale because um, in The Winter's Tale, Hermione comes to life. She's rising from the dead and the statue, Castiglione's tomb, is a statue of the risen Christ and it's the most incredible statue. It's really moving, um, the art thing. So they were the two big things for me in, in like. Thank and you. thank you all for coming today. We are a nonprofit. There is no mandatory membership fee. If you want to make a donation, you can go to our website, shakespeareauthorship.org. Our speakers graciously donate their time. And if you like what you hear, you can, um, and you're not a yearly contributor, please consider donating $15 for today.